Welcome to MediaPath. I'm Fritz Cohn. And I'm Louise Planker. MediaPath is a podcast that likes to call new entertainment options to your attention. Watching, reading, listening, whatever. We do the legwork for you in search of your interesting new content. The best part is we like to welcome amazing guests. And today we're welcoming back Mark Elliott. When we're finished here, you may want to go back into our archives at the website Media Path Podcast and listen to us talk to New York Times bestselling biographer Mark Elliott about his eye-opening book on Cary Grant. Love that book. And today he's back with his latest work called Hag, The Life, Times, and Music of Merle Haggard. Merle Haggard is one of the most revered artists in the history of country music. He and Buck Owens... Um, the Godfathers of the Bakersfield Sound. We're going to talk all about it. Mark will join us in just a second. Wheezy, what do you have? I've got Encanto. I can't wait to hear about so, it. So this is a Disney animation. The Madrigals are an extraordinary family who live in the Colombian mountains in a miraculous home they call Encanto or Enchanted. This magical dwelling has blessed every child in the family with a unique gift. Every child, that is, except Mirabelle. However, she is about to become the Madrigal's last hope when she discovers that the Encanto magic, along with the house, is crumbling. Much dancing and singing ensues as Mirabel discovers her true gifts and the richness, texture, and flavor of Colombia's people and history are fully celebrated. As the story unfolds, we learn how the ripples of generational trauma impact all of us. The cracking and compromised casita at the heart of the story is emblematic of Colombia's fate, trapped for centuries in vicious cycles of civil wars, guerrilla violence, fascist militias, armed conflict, and drug trafficking. And throughout all of this adversity, the Colombian culture, art, food, music, and people thrive. Inspired by engaging animation and a hummable score from Lynn manuel Miranda, Latinx people of every shade are embracing their representation in this beautiful film. You can go online and type uh, Encanto into it, like any social media, and you're going to find all sorts of people finding themselves and expressing themselves to the beat of Encanto music. You can watch and rewatch Encanto on Disney Plus, as many people are. That sounds fun. Yeah. Uh, at the 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 animation is so it's beautiful. So I mean, they're like iridescent colors that pop are. off the screen. Oh, it's a very colorful country. So it's cool. it's, it's a highly recommend, just fun for the whole family. And once you watch it once, you're just going to want to watch it over and over again because the music just gets gets into you. Cool. Well, I'm going to talk about Munich, yeah. The Edge of War. This is uh, brand new on Netflix as of last Saturday. It's based on a historical thriller by Robert Harris, set during the Munich Peace Conference of 1938. This is when Hitler and British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain signed an accord that would allow Germany to take over a portion of the Czech Republic as long as Adolf promises that this would be his last invasion. Well, we know how that went. Hitler had no intention of stopping there. World World War II ensued, Chamberlain became known as the Great Appeaser, and the rest is history. That pre-war scenario gets meticulously played out in this movie. It's actually filmed in the same building where the signing actually happened in Munich. Chamberlain is played by Jeremy Irons, who is a dead ringer for the Great Appeaser, <laughs> but within the historically accurate setting is placed the drama and tension of the movie, which is totally fictional. It's two friends from Oxford that end up working toward the same end, but from opposite sides. One becomes an assistant to Chamberlain. The other works in the German government, but is a secret spy for the German resistance. I know, another Hitler flick. Spare me. But the truth is, not all that much has been dramatized about the Neville Chamberlain aspect leading up to World War II. Really paints an interesting picture how Chamberlain was all pleased with himself, figuring he was going to be considered the hero of the world, but the exact opposite came true. Also, it shows how Hitler totally controlled all the circumstances and everyone else seemed to be blind to his intentions. It's a great film. British Film Company and wonderful. I think that, you know, the wisdom of, of, of perspective allows us to sort of look at Chamberlain and say, well, you know, he really didn't see what was up. No. But he was he had lived through World War One and he was really trying to keep his country out of war. I, I don't, he's not depicted as a bad fellow. He's just, no, he's not a bad guy. He just tri because he knew that his country did not want to be in war because of what happened in World War One. Mm -hmm. He thought he was doing the right thing for not only uh, Europe, but specifically for England. So he was just blind. He trusted the men and he should. 
shouldn't have. And it's interesting, too, the parallels with Woodrow Wilson, who, you know, ran on he kept us out of war. So there were, pr- were pressure on leaders in both countries to keep us out of war. But it, based on Hitler's personality, it was an inev- inevitable. And it's just really hard to know when you're on, on the in the front of history what's going to be required yeah. to save humanity. Yeah. And the difference in style between him and then Winston Churchill, who is his successor. Crazy. Good movie. Let's introduce our guest, Mark Elliott. Mark is a New York Times bestselling author of biographies of Clint Eastwood, The Eagles, Cary Grant, and just released last week an in-depth and heartbreaking work about Merle Haggard. Songwriter Steve Goodman wrote a country song that says all country songs have to include getting drunk, jail, trains, trucks, and mom. While many country artists have done songs about those topics, but very few have actually lived that life and left nothing on the table. Merle Haggard is one of those few. When you read the book Hag, The Life times and music of Merle Haggard, a couple of things will occur to you. One, that after his early life, it is a miracle he survived to become a star. Secondly, you'll realize that all of those dark roads and all of those gritty, hard-boiled experiences along the way are the reason why Haggard is considered a poet on par with Robert Frost. We're happy to welcome back Mark Elliott to talk about his wonderful new book, Mark. Welcome. Thank you. It's great to be back with you. Listen, uh, the story of Merle's family is the classic American story of the Okies, folks from Oklahoma, trying to escape poverty and escape the Dust Bowl and moving west, ultimately landing in the southern end of California's Central Valley near Bakersfield, scraping by with oil field work or agricultural work. And his family fits right into that template. You think of uh, Grapes of Wrath and those other tellings of that particular story. But what drew you to the Merle Haggard subject? Well, it's always difficult for me to pinpoint uh, the moment I decide to write about somebody. It's kind of, uh, to me, it's a pregnancy. (laughs) <laughs> and, uh, you know, no one ever knows the moment, the exact moment uh, he, she gets pregnant. Uh, <laughs> you know you're there, but you don't know exactly when you got there. Mm-hmm. Uh, Merle was um, in my mind for a while. I always, I always loved him. I always loved what he stood for. He was the, the ultimate underdog. Uh, and really everybody I write about is an underdog who live out the American dream and the American nightmare. So after, uh, at the same time, but after I uh, began the book two years ago, I was very lucky to be able to get right into the usually unpenetrable uh, haggard wall. And uh, that, that I really owe to a couple of people. But as you know, at this point, I have given the book away, Mm -hmm. uh, like women who give birth, Mm -hmm. and then the baby no longer belongs inside of, it belongs to the world, if I can use that metaphor. Of course. So when I give, when I finish a book and it comes out, um, it's it's a funny feeling. It's, uh, uh, you're never really finished with it in your head, and uh, you can never really let go I still think about Cary Grant. I still think about Jimmy Stewart, um, Steve McQueen, uh, all of them. They they uh, they resonate. They're like your children. You know, when somebody says to me, as they often do, "What what's your favorite book that you read? What should I read?" And to me, it's it's like saying, uh, "Who's your favorite child?" Uh, um, to me. They're all great <laughs> to me. They're all wonderful, and they're all like babies. So uh, I always liked Merle. I wanted to go back to music. I had done several film books, and music actually was the, my first subject. Uh, the first book I wrote, uh, Death of a Rebel, about Phil Oaks, mm-hmm. uh, ironically, which has a small, uh, of which Merle has a small part in, in this book, Phil has a small part. So there's a kind of a symmetry to all these books uh, that I do. Um, I I, I love the American dream. 
I, I think it's um, it's unique to this country in so many ways, uh, where someone like Murray, who spent almost three years in San Quentin, when beginning when he was 19 years old, eight years later, he's the biggest star in country music. Right. It, you usually see that in movies, but not so much in real life. This is a real life saga, and it's just. It's just, as you say, unbelievable, but totally believable. So much of so much of his story is completely extraordinary, and it you almost get the sense that if it weren't for like every complicated, interwoven aspect of his personality, Merle Haggard wouldn't happen. For example, you know, you're you're quoted in the book as saying Merle had an enormous capacity for feeling guilty about things he shouldn't, and feeling no guilt for things he should. Why was his calibration so off in such an important aspect of a personality? Well, Merle's father died uh, when Merle was nine years old. And children have a tendency at that age to blame themselves when something happens to their parents. But with Merle, he was especially close to his father, who, who was a musician, although he wasn't allowed to play in the house wife was a devout Christian, but he and Merle used to listen to country radio every evening after dinner. You know, they would watch the radio in those days, the big old uh, whatever they had. Um, a month before his father died, who was in, only in his 30s, uh, uh, Merle got very ill, and uh, everybody thought it was tuberculosis, but it, it turned out not to be. It was a severe flu and he recovered a month later his dad had a massive stroke and died so it's not difficult to see how merle carried that guilt around thinking that somehow he had caused his father's death uh what he and that by the way that haunted him the rest of his life uh and you can hear it in Every note of every song, there's there's a longing, there's a wanting, there's a, a sadness to the joy. And at the same time, there's a, some joy in the sadness uh, for mm -hmm. Merle. His hopeful qualities, just extraordinary. Um, what he didn't feel guilty about was the way uh, he treated some of his ex-wives. Um, and when it came to women, uh, except for Bonnie Owens, who was the most maternal of all the wives and the most patient with dealing with someone like Merle. Um, he didn't feel guilt there, but he felt something as close to love as he could get, mm -hmm. uh, considering what he had been through. You know, his relationship with women is very interesting because Flossie, his mom, was before Bonnie, the most important female in his life. And she was the uh, non-judgmental, always accepting mother. And even after he'd had all his uh, juvenile delinquent problems, always had him back in the house and embraced him with love and, and believed him in, in him. Yet his relationships with his wives were very complicated. One didn't carry into the other, as it often does. And so that was an interesting dichotomy there. Well, it, 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 he was the third or the fourth child, however you configure it. His older sister and brothers were much older than him. They were already almost out of the house. In between, she, she had um, gotten pregnant and the baby was stillborn. So Flossie, as I, as I said before, being a devout Christian, blamed, thought that God was punishing her by taking away that baby. And she vowed never to have any more children. 15 years later or so, she had Merle. And so her feeling was that Merle was a special baby. He was a gift from God, a redemptive gift. And because she was a little bit older, the other children were gone. Uh, Merle was almost like an only special baby and so she was she was reticent 
reluctant to be harsh with him. She, she wanted him to somehow find love for her in his own way. So she let him kind of run wild, not out of indifference, but out of a love for him. But you see, he had kind of like a reckless, you know, really just pedal to the metal, uh, self-destructive force where he was going to run towards danger. Like he just felt like he was hell bent in the direction of whatever mischief he could create for himself. And that's like an interesting quality when you consider who he winds up becoming because his music is infused with it. And yet he, he lives, you know, at every, at every corner you think this kid's not going to make it. He's not staying in school. He's jumping trains. He's like, well, talk about what, what all he got up to uh, before he went to prison. Well, he, uh, he was acting out his rage, I think, over uh, his father's death, his abandonment that he felt guilty about. His father loved trains, worked for the railroad, and Merle thought that trains would give him some freedom, would get him out of the prison of his own grief. Mm. And, you know, he was a small guy, but a tough guy. And uh, there were no boundaries set for him. So he didn't like school. He didn't like uh, any anything that was authoritative. And so he made his own rules, and he hung out with a bunch of kids who were tough kids. I mean, it was a working-class town, Oildale is actually where he grew up, right next to Bakersfield. The name of the town will tell you what everybody did. Mm -hmm. They all worked in the oil business. Mm -hmm. And they all wanted to let off, the men wanted to let off steam at night. And so they would go to these bars. Merle, who had a natural affinity for playing the guitar, got work in these bars. And uh, occasionally, he'd do a pickup gig. In no way a professional musician at that point. But it did two things. It taught him how to play with a band. And it taught him that women, uh, he was a magnet for young girls. Uh, and those two things both helped him and hurt him mm -hmm. throughout his career. Mm -hmm. uh, so the way, you know, he looked, he, he looked a lot like James Dean. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I call him in the book a, young, a junior James Dean. Mm -hmm. um, and he and his pals increasingly, you know, almost like addicts, they increasingly needed a bigger thrill to keep the thrill of what they saw as freedom and um, their own, the rulers of their own kingdoms. Right, right. And it got to a point where he went to a house of detention, a reform school, and he kept on escaping. He just walked off these institutions. Finally, one night, um, he and a buddy decided to break into a restaurant. And uh, they got drunk, as they usually did, went to the back, started playing with the lock, and the owner came to the back, opened the door, and said, I don't know why you're, try I don't know why you're trying to break into the back. The door's open in the front. <laughs> We're doing business. Uh, That's a metaphor. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it was like a Laurel and Hardy episode. But the kids, um, Merle went before the same judge that he had been before 17 times. Uh, and this judge was fed up with it. Yeah. Decided the only thing that would straighten this kid out was going to San Quentin, uh, where he couldn't get away with what he got away with on the streets or in overnight jails or in. Uh, junior uh, uh, retention centers. So at the age of 19, he was sentenced, uh, he, he received an indeterminate sentence of 15 years to the big house, as, as they called it. And that's where everything got worse and everything turned around. That was the pivotal time because he became self-aware of his music talent because he developed a little following in prison playing when they finally allowed him to have a guitar, which wasn't right away. He, he learned to play and he got a following in there. And he also uh, got to sit in the front row for one of Johnny Cash's classic prison concerts. And that was a transformative time in his life. He got to see the reaction of the inmates to Johnny and Johnny's stage presence and everything. And that, that really changed him, didn't it? 
Yeah, you know, Merle had this chip on his shoulder, uh, uh, the size of uh, the one that fell on the California highway that time. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, one, uh, the one that he had that size yep. chip. And uh, it was only when he saw Johnny Cash talk to these prisoners like they were men, not prisoners. Mm -hmm way he played and the songs he sang, uh, Merle had a moment, uh, uh, kind of a pregnancy moment, I guess, where he said, that's what I want to do with my life. I can do that. I know how to do it. I'm going to do it. Yeah. And uh, that eventually, when he was released, that's when his life really begins. Talk for a moment uh, about how the Dust Bowl creates the Bakersfield sound. Well, uh, everybody knows about the the uh, emigration uh, out of the Dust Bowl in the in the uh, Depression. His father uh, actually was able to find work here and there, but for several reasons, including the fact that um, Flossie had relatives in California, and she, and she had become ill and needed uh, clean air, better air to breathe. And of course, the Dust Bowl would not be the ideal place. So they moved to California, and in search of work, they wound up in Oildale. Now, the residents of Oildale and Bakersfield did not welcome uh, the uh, the immigrants from uh, from Oklahoma, Arkansas, um, Texas, and they called them Okies, Arkies, yeah. you know, whatever name. And it was not it's not a friendly term. It was a very uh, pejorative term. It would be like the N word, you know. And they treated them very very poorly. Merle's father eventually made enough money. Uh, working for the railroad to buy an old box car. It's actually a freezer car that they were no longer using. And it, it was a very good carpenter. He put it on a lot. He bought it from a, an older woman, paid her so much money every month, fixed it up, and added a room so it was almost like a house. And that kind of drive and determination made Merle only love his dad more. Mm -hmm. The Bakersfield thing and the Oildale thing about Okies and Arkies and whoever else came in uh, made it difficult for him. It's one of the reasons he, he didn't want to go to school because everybody treated him uh, uh, like an outcast, like a like a poor kid, like uh, you know, not one of us. And and so all the seeds are planted early on what would become this great explosion of autobiographical music. Mm -hmm. There really isn't a song that Merle wrote in all his entire career that didn't some way relate back autobiographically to him. And that's one of the things that's great about him. You know, you said before, well, everybody sings about this and everybody sings about that. Yes, they do. But they're very derivative. They, they, the concentration today in country music is I want to be a star. I want to have hit records. So what can I write that sounds like what have been hit records? Merle, Merle was influenced by Jimmy Rogers from the late 20s and early 30s, who he listened to with his father. Um, Bob Wills and the Texas Playboys. Hank William, of course, who everybody was influenced by. Lefty Frizzell. These are the people who influenced Merle. But his music, you can't really classify it as that kind of music or as modern country music. It's, it's the sound of Bakersfield for sure. But if you were listening to a Frank Sinatra, you know, those Frank Sinatra radio shows, a, a night with Sinatra and all that, that are on mm -hmm. every city has one, I think, or every other city. If you put a Merle Haggard record on in the middle of that, I don't think anybody would say, hey, what are you, what are you playing that for? Mm -hmm. um, Merle's music is really hard to categorize that way. Um, he, he borrowed from everybody, Elvis Presley, uh, Sinatra, B. 
Bing Crosby, and he formulated his own sound, his own singular expression. And I think long after most of the contemporary music uh, uh, coming mostly out of Nashville is kind of comes and goes and is forgotten, his last year's music, Merle's music will still be there, timeless and um, the, the most beautiful music, I think, that came out of country. So to finish the Bakersfield Sound discussion, the two godfathers of the Bakersfield Sound were Merle and Buck Owens. And it was the sound that they sort of developed playing these little honky-tonks around town. And at one time, there were tons of them, and they would go from place to place. And then um, Buck turned out to be a better businessman than Merle and, and, um, and sort of went off on a different path. But their lives stayed intertwined because Merle ended up marrying Bonnie, who was Buck's first wife, and so they, they couldn't escape one another even if they wanted to. They were frenemies. That's right. And uh, there wasn't a lot of love between them in the beginning, between Merle and uh, Buck. But, but, you know, I have a quote in the beginning of the book of what Merle said the difference was between Nashville and uh, Bakersfield, mm-hmm. the music. He said the music of Nashville came out of the church and the music of Bakersfield came out of the bars. So mm-hmm. I, I think, you know, in a sentence, there, there it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, you know, Merle's brevity hit it right on the nose. Uh, Buck was more... Uh, jangly. Uh, Buck was Buck's music was more amenable to pop, I think, than Merle. Uh, the Beatles recorded uh, one of his songs, and everybody was always covering uh, Buck, who came a, a little bit earlier than Merle. But when Merle came, uh, uh, only a, a few people covered him in the beginning, and it really wasn't until uh, Emmy Lou Harris and her generation of singers who rediscovered Merle, like uh, Dwight Yoakam, that he began to be recognized as the force that he was. Um, A lot of the the, the music that came out of the troubadour, um, the the, the eventual country rock that took over music in the 70s, the Eagles and all that, it really uh, comes from uh, the Birds, and one of the members of The Birds who said, let's record this music of this guy uh, who was not part of that sound, who was, uh, if anything, part of the other side, the valley side of uh, country music uh, in those clubs, which were not like the Troub and all those clubs. So slowly he began to get recognized as somebody who needed to be heard, who needed to be recorded. You know, you were talking before about Bakersfield. Bakersfield today is not the Bakersfield it was when uh, Merle was up and coming. There were very few clubs left. It's, it's uh, and I don't mean this in any uh, pejorative way, it, 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 uh, it's kind of a tourist attraction. Mm-hmm. People want to come and see where Merle Haggard came from and they wind up buying souvenirs and all, you know all that's not where he came from yeah that was a rough and tumble town and i'll tell you how bakersfield got on the map very very quickly um if you, if you look if you look at a map of uh las vegas reno uh all the three cities that were in vegas that's that was the circuit they called it the biggest circuit okay and then they all went to Hollywood to record, mm-hmm. mostly with Capitol Studios. So they would go west to California, and the stopover was Bakersfield. Mm-hmm. It was about halfway between L.A. and Vegas and right. uh, Apo and uh, Reno. And they would stop for a night and play a gig at a bar. And that began to put Bakersfield on the map. And then they would all go down to Hollywood and do mm-hmm. their recording and then back to Vegas. That was, that was the circuit uh, of the bands and the acts that had made it. So Merle was able to see all these big acts that came through Bakersfield. And that helped him formulate his sound. 
And then, you know, he recorded for um, uh, Tally Records, which was a small Bakersfield label. And they brought him to Capitol Records. It's a longer story than that. But once he recorded for Capitol, he flipped that switch and everything that came out of his mouth was gold. Not necessarily monetarily, but uh, in terms of the music. Uh, and, you know, his great, great songs like Mama Tried, Sing Me Back Home, which is based on seeing Carol Chessman, if you remember the Red. That was the, the story Red. I was going to get you to talk yeah. about. Yeah. You were talking yeah. about how his prison life was the transformative time in his life. And yeah. Carol Chessman being on death row and, and Merle having befriended him by being able to talk to him through the ventilation system, even though they never saw one another. They had these great deep conversations. And when Carol went to his death, that was really the one that one moment that made Merle decide he can't have a life of crime. It has to stop because I can end up there, too. That's exactly right. Uh, Carol Chessman was a cause celeb, if you remember. Anybody remembers back in the uh, 50s, uh, because he had never killed anybody. And uh, he was going to the gas chamber. And so a lot of the liberal uh, writers of the day, I guess, uh, Capote, uh, uh, Mailer, all those writers wanted him to have his sentence commuted. Merle believed he was innocent because he, and that was Merle, everybody is innocent. Nobody should be in jail. But that day, you know, the day that Carol Chessman went to the gas chamber, all the prisoners, they have a ritual. They stand in front of their cells and they run their cups back and forth and protest. Years later, Merle wrote a song about that. But what's the beginning of how you understand how great Merle was as a writer is he didn't say, think me back home. He didn't say, take me back home. He didn't say, I wish I was back home. He said, sing me back home. And that is, you can begin to see how Merle's life and his music starts to come. I think it's his most beautiful song. And I listened to it a thousand times and still get goosebumps. I watched it on YouTube preparing for this interview. It is a beautiful, beautiful song heartbreaking song. I think his best one. Uh, heartbreaking. And at the end, a gospel choir comes in. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and uh, the prisoner asks the, the head of the choir if they would sing a song his mother used to sing. So you will have that aspect in it also, the, the, the mother's influence on Merle. Yeah, I like songs. Uh, I, I love that song. There's almost nothing I don't like in Merle's music. But if we make it to December, if we make it through oh, yeah. December, I think that's the most poetic song. Oh, that he unbelievable. And, and, and about that, you brought up Dwight Yoakam's name earlier. And I wanted to mention that during the whole Ken Burns documentary, The Eight Parts, I thought the most poignant moment was when Dwight Yoakam was commenting on the talent of Merle Haggard. And he got very teary eyed about it. And uh, it talks about if we make it through December and talks about his writing process. And I thought it was the emotional peak of that entire eight-part series. I really did. Well, well I interviewed him extensively, and he also got tears. And <laughs> Merle brings out the tears. Mm-hmm. And he you know, I interviewed um, the Ken Burns people, yeah. people who did the show through Ken Burns. He, he sent me to Dayton Duncan, mm-hmm. who wrote the show and wrote the big copy table book. And Duncan, great. They all were great. They, they suggested I could see the rest of all of Earl's outtakes. At the end of the interview, uh, Dayton said, you ought to talk to this fellow, Frank Mull. And I said, I never heard of Frank Mull. And he said, nobody did. Uh, Merle never mentioned him, but he was Merle's best friend for 40 years. And I said, well, I'd like to, I'd like to Get in touch with him. Oh, here's his cell number. Call him, uh, Dayton said. A- a- and I said, well, what time do you think I should call him? Call him anytime. He sleeps with a phone in his chest. <laughs> that happened by working for Merle Haggard. Oh, uh, yeah. I called Frank, and Frank Moe is probably the fellow most responsible for me getting in touch with everybody I did. He wow. just opened the doors called people, called the daughter, called the, the, the nephew. Once he trusted that I was me, 
-hmm. he um, did everything he could to get this book done correctly. And so I, I stand on, on this book, and uh, Frank has now become a good friend of mine down in Nashville. He's just a terrific guy, warm, truthful, which was the most important thing to him was to get it right mm -hmm. and connected to everybody. And the stories in the book that he has just are wonderful, all the Bob Dylan stuff that comes later. There's so I mean, many it, there's so many conflicts within Merle that make him fascinating. And it's, it's all kind of really uh, illustrated so beautifully in your book in a way that makes it possible for us to understand how this guy is going to, you know, turn up his nose at hippies even the ones that were embracing his music and then become kind of a drug addict himself, or he's going to, you know, go see Nixon and then defend the Dixie chicks when they say something that gets, you know, their career. And like, and the, the hypocrisy of Merle saying he defends the Dixie tr chicks and then, but his records aren't burned and all of that stuff. Talk about the conflicts of the guy that, that are so fascinating. First of all, uh, Merle and uh, his, the boys in the band, or always smoking pot. I mean, it was just a part of like gasoline, you know, you needed it on the bus. And they were driving, they were on a tour going through Oklahoma and there was a sign said, uh, I think it was 10 miles to Muscogee or something like that. And someone on the bus said, the fellow who was driving, he made a joke, I'm just an Okie from Muscogee. And that's where the song began. Now Merle insisted, although, you take this with a grain of uh, salt, that the song was not an attack on hippies. It was a song about pride. Because his, his father, father's pride, right? Yeah. From Muskogee. And, you know, we believe in waving the flag and freedom and all that. He, that's what the song is about. But put in a way, in the times, that, uh, that made it uh, seem more of an attack on hippies than it was. It was differentiating them from him uh, as much as putting them uh, down. Uh, the, the other things that happened uh, with Merle, the conflicts, he, he, he loved Ronald Reagan for, for a very simple reason. Reagan gave him a part, an unconditional part. So whenever Reagan called and said, while having a big barbecue, would you come? He would come. And he thought Reagan was of the common man, whether he was or wasn't, to what Merle thought. When Nixon invited him to sing for his wife's birthday party, he was indifferent to it. He wasn't a big Nixon fan. He, he didn't think uh, um, he was good for the country. But he went. I mean, that's the kind of guy Merle was. Uh, he wanted to sing at the White House. But, you know, after they gave... Um, he got a, a signed plaque from uh, Nixon. And Merle kind of tossed it away, gave it to a friend of his. It didn't mean anything <laughs> to him. Um, later on, it, 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 when, he, um, when he was invited to have the, uh, to be given the Kennedy, Kennedy Center, Center yeah. honor, um, he, he stood side by side with Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. And they became close. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he saw Obama as one of the common people, even though he may not have been uh, with his background, but he became a worker for the people out of Chicago, an organizer, and that appealed to Merle. Uh, so his tastes, he didn't like uh, Donald Trump particularly. He didn't trust him, is what he said. And this is even before Trump was president. Very prophetic. Well, I, 16. He said there was something about him that he didn't trust. Mm -hmm. So the instincts of uh, Merle Good bullshit were detective. pretty well right on. Yeah. So you pointed out when we first introduced you, Mark, uh, um, about or Merle puts up this impenetrable wall. And even his children, in the interviews you did with them, said that this was a man that didn't warm up even to his own family very well. Do you think that's a product of having to be self-protective in prison, or it was just Merle from his early life forward? Uh, I think it, it, it's a combination of losing his father and therefore having to be out on his own to a great extent. Mm -hmm. But Dwight Yoakam said that when you... When you go to prison like that and you go through what he went through, 
you're in prison for life. Mm -hmm. You're not in prison for three years. You're in prison for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. And that you learn uh, in prison, state prison, not to trust anybody, not to turn your back on anybody, not to get too close to anybody, because it's the quickest way to get in big trouble. And I think, I think Dwight was correct. Uh, when Merle came out of prison, he never again trusted anybody completely. Uh, even, even Frank Moe, his best friend, he brought him to the edge as close as he could get him, but he never trusted anybody. And I guess Bonnie Owens, he trusted up to a degree, but not completely. He was the classic loner. Um, but coming out of the early death of his father, the sentencing in um, San Quentin, and later on his dealings with the ruthless music business mm. and uh, how he lost so much money and he was taken advantage of. You know, he was a hard guy. The, the softness, the sweetness, the insights, the beauty, the love comes out in his music. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that is really the legacy. Uh, what I try to do here is show you where it comes from, uh, who he was that made him write what he did. You know, with, with movie stars, which I wrote a few books about, you, you learn that the character that they play, audiences come to believe that that's who they are. Oh, Cary Grant is suave wonderful guy. Jimmy Stewart, this awkward kid. Steve McQueen, this tough but nice, beautiful guy. And we know that, uh, you know, today that when we go to the movies, that's not necessarily who they are. Uh, you can bank places like Entertainment Tonight or the National Enquirer or whomever you want to um, blame that to. But uh, the music business is very much like that. Uh, people that we idolize we idolize because of what we hear or see, not because of what we know, what we relate to. And Merle had the incredible ability, a, a certain kind of charisma that drew everybody in the audience and who played music to him. They couldn't figure out exactly what it was, but they loved it. Mm -hmm. and, you know, he was such a great performer that he didn't need outfits, he didn't need jangles. He, he, he dressed like a working man with a, a little hat, mostly because he was, his hair was receding. And he got up there with a band that was together mostly the whole time he was uh, performing and sang, gave the audience these beautiful songs. Occasionally he would, he would do a medley that would begin with Jimmy Rogers and go through the history of country music and then bring in his own music. Mm. So in that way, he was a teacher. Mm. He, he, he was a prophet. Uh, you know, he, he turned people on to what he wanted them to know, to hear where he came from creatively. And uh, he succeeded. As he, when, he, when he was really down and out, which was up to 2000, the year 2000, he owed everybody, not everybody, the IRS and he was just mortgaged, and, you know, women, uh, alimony, child support. Um, he, he stayed in there. And it was really Bob Dylan who, when he asked him to open for him, brought him back to huge audiences. And it was that last 10 years when, uh, when he played with Dylan for five of them that his reputation was restored. People discovered him all over again. And it's people beautiful that he, he got to do that in his lifetime. And some people aren't celebrated until after they pass, and he got to enjoy that. And that's 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 right. That's exactly right. I, I remember seeing uh, Merle and uh, Dylan in uh, in New York at the Beacon Theater. Oh, he did. And uh, he did a, he did five shows. They did five shows together. And Merle opened for Dylan. And the funny thing was, <laughs> Frank Moe was in charge of the souvenirs, the merchandise. Mm. So before, before the intermission, he'd go out and set up for people to come out. Half the audience came out and never went back. <laughs> uh, wow. They had come to see 
Merle. That was a fascinating part of your book. And not only that, that was at a time in Dylan's career because he never stopped touring. He was probably tired of performing his own songs. So he would reconfigure these songs, right. it's, it, even his hits, to the point where you couldn't even recognize what he was singing. So it was a very unsatisfactory experience for the audience. And they just got bored with Dylan and left. Right? Yeah, just, just, just right. Stayed for a, ta- a song or two and <laughs> bolted. I mean, New York was the place where, you know, Bob started. And I can remember seeing him in, uh, in a, a little coffee shop where uh, he'd be playing for 10 people. But, you know, Bob had that drive and that ambition that a lot of them in the village didn't. And I'll tell you a quick funny story about the Beacon and what you say about Dylan. Uh, you know, he, had, he has arthritis, so that's the real reason he doesn't play a lot of guitar. So he stays on the side of the stage and tapes a couple of fingers together and hits two or three chords. And the band plays whatever configuration of the songs. And part of the game is, when you see Bob, is to figure out what song he's singing. (laughs) So I was there one night, and uh, you see a lot of boomer um, divorced fathers taking their (laughs) kids to show them their own youth. So it's the father's and the sons of the daughters. So yes. sitting in front of me was a, a daddy boomer mm-hmm. and his 12-year-old daughter. And <clears throat> after Merle left, he said, now you're going to see something amazing, your legendary Bob Dylan. I, when I was a kid, and so on. Dylan comes out. About 10 minutes into the show, the girl turned to her father and said, when is Bob Dylan coming? <laughs> and, and we learned something interesting about Dylan. Dylan can hold a grudge. Man, I mean, that whole story about, um, I, I forget what the circumstance was where uh, I, I think Dylan was receiving an award and just brought up out randomly Merle's name, but was not nice about it. Talk about that and what the basis for that criticism was. Um, Merle was, was receiving a, a music award, uh, and he usually doesn't go to that kind of thing. But he went to this one. And he just ran down everybody in his life who he loved, Johnny Cash, and who he didn't like. And he said something about Merle Haggard. He, he, he out of the blue, he said, uh, you know, I like Merle, but I loved Buck Owens. I, I mean, it was, it was a kind of a, you know, when you try to figure out Bob Dylan, it, it's like uh, a Rubik's Cube time. <laughs> you just can't, you just can't do it. Every turn gets you farther away. Afterwards, Merle said, you know, and Merle is very smart about this, and this is this is the Bakerfield in uh, Bakersfield in Merle. Someone said, well, what do you think about uh, Bob, Bob, what Bob Dylan said? And Merle said, I've always loved Bob Dylan. I've always listened to Bob Dylan, and I've recorded a Bob Dylan song. <laughs> he did with Willie Nelson. He recorded that. Uh, a couple of Dylan songs, yep. and he said, "You know, uh, that's all I that's all I can say." And then he said to Frank Moe, "I think it was Frank Moe after the press left." I do believe Dylan uh, Dylan has gone senile, and, <laughs> and that's that was Merle's humor. You know, he but, but I, I maybe I was mistaken about this, but I I when 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 he he said those really sort of. Uh, sharpened comments about Merle on stage, it went back to the time when, after a show, um, Merle uh, was brave enough uh, to say to Bob, why don't you throw off the piano, go back to playing your guitar and playing the songs that people know, and Dylan didn't respond to it, and apparently, silently, did not take the criticism well, and that came to bear all those years later during that award ceremony. (laughs) Well, uh, uh, that's true. When Bob switched to the piano, Merle watched the show, and uh, he said to Bob, he, he chewed him out. He didn't just suggest to Bob. He said, get rid of that damn piano. What, what's the matter with you? People come to see you play the guitar and sing your songs the way they remember them. Mm-hmm. Dylan shrugged and walked away. Uh, but I'll tell you something interesting about that. That happened at the beginning of when Merle was playing for Dylan. Merle had a, uh, Merle loved sound checks. Um, he, he could do a sound check that was like a, a show. And the whole band had to be there. The sound had to be right. The lights had to be right. One day during the sound check, 
a guy with a hat pulled way down below his eyes and wearing a hoodie came out and sat in the audience, put his feet up uh, on the, uh, the uh, chair in front of him and sat there and listened to the whole sound check and then left. Now, everybody knew who it was. It was Bob Dylan coming out to see what it was Merle was doing. And then when Dylan came out for his part of the show, the only acknowledgement he gave was, as he was checking his mic, he, he uh, softly, he said, sing me back home. Before I die. <laughs> and everybody got it. Everybody laughed and got it. That was Dylan's way of saying, hey, you know, uh, maybe I was a little too hard. But I'll tell you this, Dylan spent the rest of Merle's life apologizing for what he said. And that's not normally what oh, Bob wow. Dylan does. Oh, wow. wow, that's interesting. Uh, because, you know, it was it's the wrong thing to say. Uh, you know, it's your celebration, it's your party. Don't take out your vengeance there. Take it out somewhere else, like in your million songs where you get everybody. <laughs> yeah. But don't take it out on Merle. I mean, uh, you know, Merle, he didn't deserve that. But, right. you know, he wasn't, he wasn't taken by it because Merle felt like the outsider anyway. He's also so, done stuff like that, too, at, at accepting awards. He's kind of like riffed, cat, man. riffed when he was receiving his CMA award. He kind of like went off script and just... I mean, That's right. He yeah, said, right? I have a so, few people on a bank and he unscrolled, you know, yeah. like, a, <laughs> girl, like, you know, like a hundred names. He, he, no, he was... Uh, he was a rowdy guy. I don't want to paint him as, a, you know, as a saint. He, he was a, a rowdy guy. He didn't like authority. He didn't particularly like uh, awards. He liked to perform. He liked to sing. He liked to write. He liked to be with Bonnie, with her for a long time until that fell apart. Um, he, he, he was what he was. And the only reason we care about him is because the legacy of his music is so powerful, is so great, is so uh, um, mesmerizing that one person, you know, could be like uh, like Merle and write like um, Frost, uh, like like the, all the poets right. uh, that he, you can relate to him, like Robert Frost. You can know, you tell Merle. the story of the Ed Sullivan show in Oklahoma, which I guess was at a point in his career where he felt like he needed to do this? And then he reached a wall. Well, that's a really funny story. It was his manager, um, Fuzzy Owen, not Owens, Fuzzy Owen, I was trying to get Merle to do more things. And uh, Ed Sullivan, I think it was 71, he, he was starting to go down. He was starting to end his reign. And he wanted to do a, a tribute show to Rogers and Hammerstein. And he wanted to do it out of the Hollywood Bowl just to shake things up for his own show. So he asked all these country people to do to be on the show. And he wanted Merle, or Fuzzy got him to take Merle to do um, Curly in a scene from Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And Merle didn't want to do it. He said, uh, hey, I'm not a dancer. I don't sing show tunes. <laughs> what are you doing to me? Fuzzy said, do it. It, you'll, it. it will enhance your audience tenfold. This is Ed Sullivan. Um, so Merle begrudgingly agreed to do it. And during rehearsals, they made him do the, you know, the dance right? in Oklahoma, the square dancing and all that. And uh, he, he hated it. And then the, 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 the day, the, the last rehearsal that they had, Merle claimed, that uh, one of the boys in the chorus pinched his rear end, pinched Earl's rear end. <laughs> and that was it for him. He stormed off the stage, went into his bus, and wouldn't come out. Uh, uh, Bob Precht, who was, who was Sullivan's producer, came banging on the door. Sullivan, you'll never work. You'll never be on TV again. Uh, Fuzzy begging him to come out, but he wouldn't do it. So at the last second, they got uh, John Davidson. Uh, yeah, Davidson. Who knows the part? Who was in? Yeah, it was in it a million times. Uh, so he came at the last minute and did it. But uh, Merle didn't appear again on CBS for a very long time. 
uh, after that. Uh, he did appear on Johnny Cash, but he was on ABC, and that show came out of the Ryman. But, uh, you know, Burl was not the kind of guy who pinches bottom and he just says, oh, you know, <laughs> I'm walking too slow here. I mean, he, he didn't like it. If a woman had done it, uh, Frank Mull said if a woman had done it, he would have been in heaven. But uh, he would have married her. <laughs> he would have married her. Now, so let's talk about the wives and the kids. I cannot believe that a judge gave Merle custody of these kids. Like, what? You don't say a lot about the first Leona. I guess there were more than one Leonas. When you run through that many wives, you're going to start to duplicate the names. But what judge gives Merle, who's never home, custody of these kids? Well, Leona, who he married, I think, when she was 17, the first Leona. Uh, while he was in prison, had a baby with another guy. Mm -hmm. And that didn't sit too well with Merle. And she had her own problems. She had uh, issues that made her unfit to be a mother. I, I don't want to go into them, but, you know, what, whatever you might imagine, uh, whatever addictions you can think of, uh, whatever tendency she might have had, a judge just uh, didn't uh, think she'd be a fit mother. On the other hand, Flossie, who was involved with, with this decision, said, I will take care of the kids better than she will. And the judge agreed. So the judge let Flossie, and again, the angel of Merle's life, took in these kids mm -hmm. and, and reared them. You know, Merle, while he was in prison, he had a tattoo of uh, Leona's name. On his, on his wrist. And when he married uh, the third Leona, uh, he said to Frank, look how great this is. I don't even have to get a new tattoo. <laughs> but he, he tried to make it work with Leona when he got out of prison a little bit, didn't he? He just wanted to try to go in the straight and narrow? And that was, that was his first, that was his, you know, his first love, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, he couldn't do it. He, he and his pal, Every once in a while, they would, uh, when they, he couldn't stand that domestic life. And this was really before he had hit the big, big time. Um, so he and, he and his pal, uh, his childhood pal who was with him the rest of his life, um, said to Leona, Merle said, I'm going out for some cigarettes. And they disappear for three days. They go to Vegas hit all the whorehouses, get all that out of them, and then he'd come back. And uh, Leona would say, like the old Joe, where are the cigarettes, you know? I mean, uh, <laughs> it, it, it was that kind of a relationship. She certainly didn't miss him because she had her own thing going. So it, it really wasn't much of a marriage. It was a teenage romance. And in those days, you know, we're looking at uh, uh, the late 50s. You had a girlfriend, you went steady, and then you got married. So that's that's what they did. You know, he loved Bonnie was the one love of his five marriages that he really truly loved. I think the love of his life. Why, why did that not work? And even after it didn't work, she continued to perform with him for years. It didn't work uh, because Bonnie couldn't face the truth before they got married. And Bonnie, by the way, was the sweetest, most loving woman on earth, <laughs> I can uh, make a statement like that. When, when she and Merle got married, uh, she had two children by Buck Owen, Buck Owens, a few years back. They had been divorced for a while. And Merle had these two kids. And so uh, they bought a house, and uh, the, uh, Merle's kids came to live with them. And Kelly Haggard, Merle's daughter, told me this story that... Uh, she was so angry that every time she was near something, she would throw it on the ground. If, if, uh, if there was food on the table, she would take tomatoes, throw them on the ground, throw them around the room. Just really an angry little girl. And she said, Bonnie came over to her and said, darling, there's nothing you can do that would make me not love you. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And from that moment, everything changed. Mm -hmm. It was not a family of two and two. It was a family. It wasn't a stepmom. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And she became, for all intents and purposes, Bonnie's, uh, 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 Kelly's 
mother. Mm -hmm. But before they got married, to get back really to what you were saying, Merle said to Bonnie, look, I am who I am. And I learned from my first marriage that I can't change that. I run around with women. I drink. Um, I, I like to run with the boys. And I'm not about to make up stories to you. If you want to marry me, that's the deal. It's me, and it's if I want to go with a, with a, 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 a truck driver stop hooker, I'm going to go. And if you want that, then you have me. You know, she thought she could handle it, but um, who could handle that? It still hurts every time. And I know she, I know she loved him and everything. And it makes you kind of wonder why he felt the urgency to be married at all times. He really should have just been a single guy, but he always wanted to get married again. Well, I think I think uh, it, that's a very good point. But I think what what it means is that he was always looking for Flossie. Mm. He was always mm -hmm. looking for a woman like Flossie, who, when he was a baby, you know, worshipped him. And you know what, what Freud said: "I want a girl just like the girl who married dear old dad." You know, he uh, <laughs> he, he he wanted a girl like Flossie, yeah. but. There was no girl like Flossie. So he would try, he would marry them, and they would turn out not to be what he wanted. And if you look a little deeper, that was probably self-serving because that drama kept him falling off bar stools and keeping the whiskey flowing. Mm -hmm. you know, it was a way of reinvigorating his creative side. Mm -hmm. When he brought Leona, the second Leona, Leona too, Leona Williams, who's still, still performing, uh, when... He brought her into his life. Bonnie was still in the band. Yeah. Um, he brought Leona on, on stage with him and relegated Bonnie to the back. That was when she left. That, you know, if, if it was personal and he didn't throw it in her face, she could take it. Uh, but when he did that to her, she took it as a public humiliation and left. And it was a three-dimensional painting, too, because Bonnie was kind of his muse. She walked around the house and recorded songs that he was improvising walking around the house and made order out of his new creations and sort of supported his talent as well, right? Absolutely right. He couldn't read music, and um, he, was, he couldn't, couldn't spell or write that well because he didn't go to school. So Bonnie, when he would pick up the guitar and he would start, you know, tonight, the bottle, she would grab a, a like a legal pad <laughs> and write down everything he said and uh, chord it, you know, put the chords on top uh. and transcribe it. And she was a musician. And so then when he would like, go back to it, he would remember what he had, mm -hmm. what he'd written. Mm -hmm. So she really, she was the one who helped him write all those great songs um uh, there's the song he wrote called uh, today i started loving you again right and um it, it's a beautiful song i mean just just breathtaking and it it based on they were they weren't getting along which is for merle not this not the big surprise of this interview um they were uh, they flew back from a little tour they did and Bonnie was waiting by the luggage cart, you know, to pick up the luggage. And he just looked at her and he said, you know, today I started loving you again. Legal pad, pen. <laughs> and, uh, and that became one of his greatest songs, uh, one out of many, many, many great she songs. She was a song catcher. Mm -hmm. She was a song catcher. Yeah. And she was... She was uh, Flossie May Jr. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, she left him, whereas he left all the other wives. She left him. And he never got over that. She eventually came back. And um, when she got sick uh, in, in the early 90s, she had early signs of Alzheimer's disease. And it grew progressively worse. I won't go into the stories here, but toward the end, uh, Frank Moe and Scott Joss, 
Scott Joss, who had been the, the keyboardist for 48 years in the band, mm -hmm. and their wives were out to dinner. Um, and Bonnie was having dinner uh, across, across the way. She came over to Frank and she said, oh, it's great to see you, Frank. Uh, won't you introduce me to your friends? She had known them oh, for her whole life. Okay. And that's when everybody knew that it was close to the end. Yeah. When she was committed to a hospital because she couldn't take care of herself anymore, uh, they called Merle and they said, if you want to see her again, say goodbye, this is the time. So he went to the hospital. He went into her room. He sat down. And she said, oh, what a lovely man. Uh, who are you? And right behind her was a giant picture of Merle Haggard. Oh, my goodness. So, you know, devastating. And she passed away not long after that. But, you know, it, it was out of all the women, she was the one who was closest, closest in his mind to Flossie May and the one that he hoped could tolerate, just like Flossie May did. Yeah. He hoped that she could tolerate who he was and not try to fix him, change him, restrict him. Uh, and always be there when he would wander back in off of one of his wanderlusts. Yeah. Flossie was always there and always took him back. Well, there's different expectations in a marriage than there are in a mother-son relationship. When, when he was in uh, San Quentin, uh, Flossie, Flossie didn't drive. So she and, and when uh, his older brother, uh, James, couldn't drive her, she would take a bus for four hours to go see him for the 25, 30 minutes and take a bus four hours back. I mean, that that was Flossie. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a big influence on him. Let's and talk then, about, uh, you know, the question most asked of you at any cocktail <laughs> party. What's next, Mark? What are you thinking? Who are you thinking of writing a book about? Well, uh, let me say this to you. Yeah. Right now, I'm pregnant. Ah, and he's pregnant. Okay. So I want to keep. I want to keep that for me for a while. Is it a boy or a girl? A uh, twins, uh -huh. and then. <laughs> <laughs> and have then a gender reveal party. You will be the first, guys. All to right. Know. We're excited. I'm, I absolutely promise you that. I love doing your show. I love you guys. Well, I, I love this book, Mark. And I'll tell you, to draw this to a conclusion, uh, I wish I could be as uh, touching as you drew your book to the conclusion because we're talking about the fact that the death of his father was something he never recovered from. Uh, you draw the book to a conclusion talking about Merle being hours away from death and saying he was ready to go. He wanted to go see his dad. And it was so touching, I dropped the book on the floor when I was reading it in my bed. It really was beautifully written and interesting. And I'm wondering if your relationship with his children continues today. I know them. Um, they, uh, the boys are musicians. Kelly is living up uh, near the, uh, the ranch uh, that Merle had. I'm actually closest uh, to Frank Merle, Dwight Yoakam, and um, Marty Stewart. They, yeah. they all became mm -hmm. friends of mine. And they're actually more uh, uh, in tune with who I am mm -hmm. um, rather than the, the children or uh, the wives and all that. Uh, uh, I can identify with these guys on many levels. Because, well, they embrace you know, legacy I, the way you do. And it's kind of like, it's just that they're a mutual appreciation society of people that, that really, really treasure the legacy. And Marty Stewart, in that Ken Burns documentary, he was like the through line in the whole thing. He knew he's, everybody. He was, a, he was a country music historian. I loved hearing his commentary. He's the Wynton Marsalis of the yeah, piece. seriously, seriously. It took them eight years to make that series. It wow. was beautiful. I watched it a couple of times. It was beautiful. That's great. I mean, Ken Burns, he's, yeah. you know, he's his own category. Yeah, absolutely. Well, nice job, my friend. I hope it brings you lots of success in the right. country field and out. All right. 
Mark, this is the point in our show where we beg people to review us on <laughs> Apple Podcasts. Take it away. And if you enjoyed this episode of Media Path, it would help us to be more discoverable by potential new listeners if you would leave us a quick review on Apple Podcasts. And if you're new here and this is your first time with us, please check out our back catalog, including our previous interview with Mark uh, uh, with his wonderful book, his revelatory book about uh, Cary Grant. It, it, it's worth it. Go look in our catalog. Thank you for spending an hour with us, and we would be overjoyed if you uh, took a moment to share your thoughts with us or recommend us to a friend. We would love for you to join us online on Instagram and Twitter, where we are at Media Path Pod, and on Facebook, where our show page is Media Path Podcast, and our Facebook group is Media Path with Fritz and Wheezy Podcast Community. You can find full episodes with all kinds of bonus visual content on our YouTube channel, Media Path Podcast. We would love to know what media you have been enjoying, so you can contact us at our social media or email us at Media Path Podcast at gmail.com. We want to thank our wonderful guest, Mark Elliott. Our team includes Dina Friedman, Francesco DeManda, John Maddox, Sharon Bellio, Bill Filipiak, Thomas Hubble, Mason Brown, and you. Our theme music is by me and John Maddox. I am Louise Palanker, here with Fritz Coleman and Mark Elliott, and we will see you along the media path. All right, so we're going to take our picture with you, Mark, but we have to stand up and get next to the screen. What do you want me to do?